first heard the name Python, saw the little logo, I assumed it was some snake reference or metaphor going over my head. It was actually uh, developed by this uh, Dutch programmer, Guido van Rossum, but uh, around the time that he was naming it, he had been watching a lot of Monty Python sketches, so he named it Python after Monty Python. And uh, it was released in 1991, and it is now the fourth most widely used programming language around the world. It's a general purpose language, which means it's used for just about anything, not specifically data science. Data science is just one particular use case for it. It's interpreted, which means as opposed to some languages which are compiled beforehand and then they run, uh, Python is just compiled and converted as it goes. And it's used in a, a huge range of applications. It powers giant platforms such as Instagram and Reddit. Intel uses it to test their microchips. It's widely used in video game development. And it's also very popular in what we're here to talk about today, which is data science. It's a open source, which means that the source code is visible to the public. So anybody can create their own implementation of Python or write their own packages for it. And there's a lot of packages out there. There's also multiple versions of Python uh, out there right now. There's Python 2 and Python 3, and they're not fully backwards compatible. There's some syntax in Python 2 that will not run in a Python 3 environment and vice versa. There are packages and tools that you can use to mitigate this, but it's by no means seamless and it's something to be aware of. Some general pros and cons of the Python language, starting with the pros. It's very easy to read and learn. When uh, developing Python, they put a lot of focus on simplicity. They got rid of a lot of uh, unnecessary syntax that you see in other languages. And they tried to make it as similar to natural speaking language as possible to uh, make it easy to understand. It also has dynamic typing. So when you're using a variable, you don't have to declare what type of variable it is. It just assumes the type once you put data inside of it, which is convenient. It's also, uh, with Python, everything is an object, which makes object-oriented programming a lot easier. And on top of uh, being very good with memory management while it's running, the Python program itself is uh, very small and doesn't take a lot of space on the, any system. And this is largely because the core Python code doesn't contain a ton of uh, libraries or functionalities to do most things. You have to import the packages and modules that you want to use. But due to it being open source, there are tons and tons and tons of packages out there for you to use. And Python is also uh, multi-threaded, which means that it can run tasks in parallel, more than one at the same time, which uh, greatly increases efficiency when you're working with uh, huge amounts of data. And because Python is general purpose and so widely used, a lot of existing applications or environments will already have Python installed, which makes uh, implementing a new model a lot easier. And as far as some of the negatives that come along with Python, because it's interpreted instead of compiled, speed can be an issue sometimes, although people have made implementations of Python that are meant to run faster, notably uh, PyPy is a popular one. And Python also uses an indention or white space instead of the curly brackets or parentheses that you see in other languages. It makes it a lot easier to read the, and understand the code, but it does introduce some restrictions when it comes to how you're able to customize the functionality of your code. And because of the dynamic typing where your variables will just assume the type when you put data in it, this can cause uh, some errors when you push your code to production and it introduces uh, some data that wasn't ready for and it assumes the wrong type. This will give you errors. And although there are packages out there that are meant for uh, accessing databases from your Python code, they are uh, far from perfect and there's a lot of room for improvement with that area. And oftentimes the simplicity of Python causes people issues if uh, all they look at is Python and they introduce some code in a different language, such as uh, if a Python developer was shown some R code, it can be a little more difficult to understand than let's say if a R developer was looking at Python code. Mm -hmm. And it's also, uh, compared to R, a relative challenger in the data science arena. It, uh, although it's growing more and more popular, R is still uh, the most popular language for data science and it has a few more uh, packages and functionalities out there compared to Python. And some use cases as far as uh, when uh, it's useful to use Python. 
when you're reading data, whether it be a CSV file that's too large to be effectively handled in Excel, or if your data is coming in formats like pictures or video, Python is great for reading that into a usable data object. And as far as all the cleansing, preparation, and munging of your data that you need to do on it to make it useful in analysis, Python is great for this. As far as dealing with null values or transforming and assigning logic to all the different features. And although they're within all the packages available, there's tons of different models and algorithms for you to use. If you are find it necessary to write your own, the simple logic of Python makes it very easy to do so. And as we mentioned earlier, because uh, Python backends exist so commonly in different applications and systems, if you're pushing a model uh, into production on an existing system, Python is great for that because you likely won't have to install any new software. And nowadays there's tons of new uh, smart devices and Internet of Things applications. And Python has become a very popular choice when it comes to dealing with and analyzing the data that comes from uh, these machines. And as far as uh, big data solutions, a lot of you have probably heard of Apache Spark, which is a big data distributed file system similar to Hadoop that was made to run extremely fast. And it has the built-in capability to run Python code on the platform, which makes it very convenient. And as far as uh, any other development tasks that are using Python for, a very common tool is Jupyter Notebooks. It's um, an online browser notebook application where you just use through your browser that uh, makes it very easy to develop code, and that's what we'll be showing the demo in later. And I'm gonna give you a over quick overview of how modules and packages work within Python. A module is just a Python script file hardly different than a text file that has a collection of functions defined within it. And then you can take that module and combine it with other modules to put it into a package. And then that package can then be combined with other packages and or more modules into you know, another package and the hierarchy can just continue. And then when you go to write your own Python code and you want to use some of the functions that reside within this package, at the top of the code, you simply import the package, and then when you want to call the function, you just specify where that, the module, where that function is located, and the name of the function, and you can use it, and it references back to that function that was defined wherever in the hierarchy of that package. Although, many times you don't want to import the entire package because you only want to use one specific module or function out of it, and not have to incorporate all of the rest of that package into the memory. And to do that, you simply, in the import statement, you specify where in the package the module you're looking for is located, and you can even give it an alias so that it's easier to reference later in your code, and it functions similarly and still calls back that same function. And to install and manage the dependencies of all of these different packages, you will need a package manager. PIP is the default package manager for Python. It comes installed with Python 3, Python 3, not Python 2, though. If you're using Python 2, you have to install it separately, but it comes out of the box with Python 3. And then its major competitor would be Conda, which is installed with the Anaconda distribution of Python. And PIP installs packages from the Python package index, which is the largest and the official uh, repository for Python packages that anybody can write their own package and upload to to make it available to anybody. While the Conda package manager only installs packages that are included in the Anaconda distribution, which is a smaller subset, but they tend to be more focused on data science, so Conda is very popular in the analytics industry. And while PIP can only manage Python packages and Python dependencies, Conda can manage packages and dependencies from other languages, such as Java or R. And sometimes you need to separate the packages on your system, either due to conflicting dependencies, or if you have a project that requires one version of this package, and you have another project that requires a different version of that package, and you need to have both installed, you have to use uh, virtual environments and Conda has this functionality built in, the ability to work with the virtual environments, but for PIP, you're going to need to use a separate tool to do that. Now I'm gonna go through uh, some of the common packages within Python that are used for data science. 
First one would be NumPy, which creates the array object as well as developing a lot of uh, arithmetic and operations around arrays and also includes a lot of uh, numerical analysis methods. And there's uh, Pandas, which is built on top of NumPy and is the most popular package for data science analytics within uh, Python. It creates the data frame object, which is the data type that is most commonly used when you're doing uh, data science. And matplotlib is the go-to package for visualizations within Python. It has huge variety of capabilities while still remaining relatively uh, simple to use and understand. There's also scipy, which includes a lot of functions around linear algebra and optimization, which are the cornerstone of most uh, machine learning. So although there are a ton of uh, algorithms out there available through packages. If you're interested in writing your own machine learning algorithms, this will be a very useful package. And then scikit-learn is a package that includes a lot of those pre-made machine learning algorithms, and scikit-learn is the most popular package when it comes to Im implementing common machine learning algorithms, and it has a ton of uh, functions and methods around this for evaluating and customizing your algorithms, as well as functions for splitting your data into testing and training data as Brian showed earlier. And the last one I have for you is TensorFlow, which uh, is getting very popular these days. It was developed by Google and it implements a deep learning algorithm and deep learning is just a specific and complex type of machine learning that's particularly popular with analyzing picture and video data. So now I am going to go into a quick demo. So this is the Jupyter Notebook that I was talking about earlier. It's uh, operated through the browser. And it organizes your code into these cells, as they're called. And so you can just uh, run a single chunk of your code at a time, and it displays any output there is directly below that cell. Makes it very easy for uh, running through your code step by step. And at the top, is where you import all of the packages and modules that you want to be using. You'll see some of the ones I mentioned earlier, NumPy, Pandas, I have a couple modules from scikit-learn and matplotlib. And then I use a pandas function to read our CSV into a data frame object. And then there's a few functions that allow you to uh, explore your data. The head function just shows you the first five rows so you can see what your data looks like. And then the D types functions will show you the data types for your different columns so you can make sure that they're the type that you want them to be. The describe function just gives you a quick summary of your numerical data between the different uh, statistics and quantiles. As well, it, it includes the counts. So you can look across and see if any of your columns are missing data points. We can see the horsepower has less data points than all of the rest, so there must be some null values somewhere in there. And so we're gonna deal with that with uh, this function, which there's several different methods for dealing with null values, but a common one is to simply replace the null value with the median for that column, and that's what we're gonna do here. Then I'm gonna separate out the response variable, which is what we're trying to predict, and then drop the columns that we're not gonna be using for prediction, which is the name and the origin. This is where we split the data into the training data and the testing data, which as Brian mentioned earlier is important for uh, measuring the strength of your model and to make sure it's not overfit. And here's where we need to scale our data, which is another topic uh, Brian hit on earlier. And we're gonna be using the same scaling method that he used, which is the min-max scaler. Well, he defined his manually. We're just going to use a built-in one that comes included with the scikit-learn package. Here's where we define the parameters, the learning rate, and number of iterations. Again, the learning rate being how big of steps that your algorithm takes when it's going down that curve, and then the number of iterations being the maximum number of steps that it will take without converging. And here is a chunk of code where it actually implements the algorithm. First, it makes predictions based on the current coefficients. Then it calculates the accuracy of your model 
based on those predictions, then uses that to develop the gradient and then adjust your coefficients accordingly. Then for each iteration, it spits out a little bit of information about it and then just keeps iterating until it either converges on the answer or reaches the maximum number of iterations. So we're gonna run that and it'll take a few seconds. So it stopped at iteration 1955. And see, you can see from the, this graph of our error, this is a mean absolute error at the very beginning. It started very high and it quickly decreased before just slowly decreasing after that. And even at iteration number 50, you can see it kind of starting to level out, even though it doesn't stop until iteration 1955. And then here are the coefficients or the weights that it came up with for our answer, our measure of the accuracy, which is the R squared, or the coefficient determination. And then it tells you how long it took, process took seven seconds. And then below that, this is a chunk of code where it solves it mathematically, as uh, the two Brian's were talking about earlier. <laughs> it, um, what we're doing here, linear regression, can be solved mathematically, not using the gradient descent. Although the gradient descent method can be generalized to uh, many other machine learning applications, this specific one, linear regression, can be solved mathematically. And this is a tiny little chunk of code that does that. You can see the process took less than a hundredth of a second. Came up with coefficients, which you can see aren't too different from the ones our gradient descent came up with. And uh, the accuracy measure. So the highest accuracy that our gradient descent could have reached is this value which is only marginally larger than what we came up with through our self-defined algorithm. So it did pretty good.